Well, good morning. Uh, we're still waiting on a couple of members here, perhaps. Uh, we'll just give it another minute, maybe. Um, welcome all the people who are joining uh, around the state for our Children's Cabinet meeting on February 4th, 2022. Good morning, Kim. It's Melissa. Good morning. Well, I don't know if we're going to pick up any, but we, we are expecting a couple of members to join us uh, a little bit after our start time. So my plan right now is that we uh, will I'll call the meeting to order. And um, again, welcome everyone who's joining. And then I think what we'll probably do is, um, sorry about that deal with an unnecessary scam call on my phone. Um, get the phone turned off here. I apologize for that. Um, and we'll we'll skip the approval of the minutes until we get our full group here, but we'll move on to uh, the budget recommendations update. So uh, let, let's go ahead and do that while we're waiting on every to get our full membership here. Okay, Kim, thank you and, and welcome to everyone that's joined us. Um, I, I wanted to take the chance to review for our cabinet members the current status of our budget recommendations. Um, so I, I just wanted to refresh in everyone's minds um, the role of the cabinet it includes um, seven different charges, but but the two that are featured here really um, speak to our um, responsibility to make sure that we are making recommendations regarding the combining of funds across departmental boundaries and proposing um, actions that will help us achieve coordination in our system, and that may pertain to funding or services. And it, so it's, it's really, um, you know, has been the, the goal of the cabinet from inception that we help coordinate between multiple state agencies because of the way the, the Kansas early childhood system is arrayed across multiple state agencies. Um, so, um, all right, so uh, the other thing that we keep in mind is the strategic plan for early childhood and the, the work that's been done to create a comprehensive system that will best serve um, children, their families, providers, um, and, and help coordinate and effectively leverage our funds. Um, and I, I'm sorry, um, Deanne is definitely trying to um, log in to the meeting. Lindsay, would you maybe help I can, connect with her? I yeah, I'm going to resend her the information yeah, um, would be via great. email, and, and I hope that helps. I haven't seen anyone else try to join, so um, we'll do our best. Thank she you. She said she was in and got removed. So. Yeah, I was doing. I was. I was trying to send a message. Also, sorry to interrupt. Okay, you. sorry. So, I, sorry for the distraction. All right, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so um, to dial back to our June fourth meeting when the cabinet took up budget recommendations, we really did keep. Um, some principles in mind that you see outlined on the screen. We wanted to ensure that we are streamlining and aligning our CIF funding allocations for maximum impact. And we wanted to look ahead and do some planning for next year when our PDG grant um, is coming to a close and we, we have some really big initiatives that we want to continue to support in Kansas that are 
initiatives that involve a partnership among our state agencies. So we wanted some capacity within the CIF for the cabinet to participate in the, the effort to maintain and grow um, those resources. We also, um, as a cabinet, want more funding capacity within the Early Childhood Block Grant. We've, we've been pretty static for a number of years, and I think we've had some growing pains with um, programs that are very successful at what they do that um, can't do, can't serve more with, with static amounts of funding. Um, they too feel the effects of inflation over time and um, growing need in communities across the state. So we wanted to enable a, a more grant making capacity in the early childhood block grants. We definitely um, planted our feet firmly in the camp of the need for increased funding for universal home visiting services. Um, currently, our statistics tell us that we're only meeting about 8% of the need in the state, and we, we definitely need to grow that program. And then finally, um, in our designated role as state lead for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library Project, we really were looking for, um, this was this was something that evolved over the course of the year, but um, we need a way to sustain that program. So those were the principles that we discussed as a cabinet last June. You made very specific budget recommendations at the time. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so we, we definitely saw our recommendations honored in the governor's budget um, documents. So one of the, the, the first recommendation that we made as a cabinet was to fund the statute, which says the key fund will transfer 102.5% of the prior year amount to the, the CIF. We didn't quite get the two and a half percent increase, but we did get an increase that it, it's about 1% more funding for the CIF. And that funding is channeled into a number of, of helpful projects. We also had a series of, of recommendations that, that recommended that certain specific funding lines no longer be transferred out of the CIF, that they get funded at the appropriate agencies through other sources of funding so that we could, could maintain the capacity those dollars represented. And um, finally, we, we made a recommendation that the CADE or Start Young line item um, be incorporated into the Early Childhood Block Grant. So those things happened. We got, uh, we got a little bit of an increase in the overall CIF transfer. We have seen an increase in the early childhood block grant of 2.36 million for next year. Um, that includes the million dollars for Cade, but it, that obviously that still gives us additional room in the early childhood block grants to either you know, make make funding decisions to fund full requests or increase the amounts um, of the maximum or add new programs. We have a recommendation that was passed in June to um, set aside a little bit of that funding for some innovation grants. So we can evaluate from applicants whether we have received those innovative um, ideas that we might want to try. Um, but those are decisions for the, the ECBG funding um, meeting in April. We have an increase in the maternal child health home visiting line item. Um, the $1.4 million more was added. So we will be able to transfer 1.65 million over to KDHE for that program. That is the universal home visiting program. Um, so we will be able to increase capacity. There was very careful consideration about whether um, 
transferring too much money at once created a, a, an inverse sort of problem where we had money that um, could pay for more, more universal visits, but the inability to grow the program quickly enough to meet that in one year's time. So we're trying to be strategic and um, be good stewards and, and not bite off more than can be chewed um, in a given year. So we're really happy with that amount of increase. The Dolly Parton Imagination Library has a new line item in the CIF um, funding in the amount of $500,000, which will help us transition from the status we have now, which is a, a sort of statewide lead but that can't really fund statewide. So we've had to um, focus our efforts to start new chapters of the, the program in counties that do not currently have it. This $500,000, um, that's the, but the money that will allow us to truly become a statewide partner who can match funding that exists in, in communities currently and um, be a 50-50 partner so that we can work to, to grow the program, which is really exciting. The, the other new line item in the CIF is something we called early childhood infrastructure. That new $1.4 million will help us with our support for um, the, the the collaborative projects that, that we have underway. So you see just three examples of what we mean. There are others. We are about to release an RFP to um, find a vendor to build a workforce registry for the early childhood um, child care providers. And we um, are working on a career pathway. We, are, we have a lot of exciting projects in, in the works. And so this infrastructure line item will help the cabinet um, continue to be a partner at the table that can help sustain these, these programs and projects over time. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of what is in the CIF budget as it currently stands. Um, we've reviewed the new budget line items. Um, you can see the early childhood block grants, and you can see the other programs and services that remain part of the CIF budget. So the job through the legislative session is to protect what is in the budget. We just need to communicate that we are really happy with, with what was recommended by the governor and encourage the legislature to um, support these budget recommendations. And um, that, will, that will be huge for this cabinet and the work that we focus on. The line items that are no longer part of this are programs that are equally important, but the, the relevant agencies that run those programs agreed with the cabinet recommendations and incorporated requests for funding where necessary. I think the children's mental health waiver is one that um, needed a, a, a budget request from um, the KDADS budget where Medicaid programming lives. We uh, worked with KDHE on the infant toddler hearing aid bank and the autism um, well, the, the infant toddler hearing aid bank that should be absorbed into the, the hearing program through existing resources. The Child Care Quality Initiative will um, become part of DCF's links to quality, quality improvement work. Um, so all things that, that bring value to the, the system but can be funded through other means. So this is, this is, big progress for us at the Children's Cabinet. I've been proud to uh, be invited to speak on behalf of the Cabinet to share the, this background with legislative committees. So far, I've talked to the House Social Service Budget Committee, which reviews the parts of the CIF budget that go to DCF and, and a couple of the other agencies. I have address children and seniors committee in the house to talk both 
policy and CIF budget. And then Tuesday of this week, I address the House Appropriations Committee. I will say we have been very well received, very warmly received for our work. It has been noted that this cabinet operates from um, a performance-based budget standpoint so that we, um, we are constantly evaluating the, the um, the investments that we make and the results that we're seeing and honoring those, those things that, um, you know, decision-making that needs to be made with, um, with outcomes in mind. So, um, I, I just, I thought it really would be important for all of you to understand where we stand with our budget, um, to the extent that you have opportunities to interact with lawmakers and let them know how pleased you are to see our recommendations enacted. Um, that would be welcome. And um, I, I also wanted to give you all the opportunity to ask any questions to, to better understand where things stand. So at that, I will open it up for cabinet discussion. Melissa, it's Lietta. Thank you for your hard work on this. It's reflected in every line item. I'm thrilled beyond words to see the early childhood infrastructure program and the addition of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. I've been wanting that since joining this wonderful group. So thank you and kudos. Well done. We appreciate the vision of this, this group to, to see the value of these things. Melissa, uh, I don't think it's specifically on the agenda, uh, but would you just kind of comment on your take on the tobacco settlement update in terms of, uh, I took it as, um, well, as uh, long-term prospects are uh, clouded, uh, but there wasn't a, like an immediate threat. Is that, is, uh, Kim, is that yeah, a Kim, way to read it or not? Kim, this is Melissa. I, I would, um, just for, for those watching, Kansas Legislative Research Department did a, a review, an update about the Master Tobacco Settlement that was published on their, their online website. Um, it, it, it's dated December of 2021. I will note that it takes a very cautionary tone about the tobacco settlement and future receipts. That has been the posture adopted since inception. Um, there is always wariness that we are relying on the sale of tobacco products. And as people recognize the harmful effects. I mean, that was the point of the lawsuit, right? That, that cigarette smoking causes all sorts of health issues that were never properly disclosed uh, by the tobacco companies. There, there was effort to um, whitewash the harmful effects. So tobacco cessation programs and, you know, different different policies adopted to begin to limit where smoking is allowed or the rise of non-tobacco types of nicotine products, um, there is always risk to the, the funding stream that we rely on. And that is part of the message that I have made sure to incorporate into my presentations, that it, it puts us in a really uncomfortable position, that all of our good work is predicated on the sale of tobacco products. So, um, we, we are in a, a very strange position here. So routinely, annually, what happens is in November, the, the consensus revenue estimating group meets to forecast for the upcoming fiscal year what expectations are for a whole range of revenue streams so that the, the budget forecast can be Put together and, and give the legislature a picture of, of what might be expected. And they routinely underestimate the, the tobacco receipts. So you will see a line item in the key fund, um, the receipts from the MSA. They, they, I think it's 47 million 
is what's estimated yes. for the coming year. I will tell you that in April, the receipt amount, you know, our settlement amount for the prior year is announced because it's because it's based on the sale of tobacco. It it's there's a lag. So the funding that will be announced this coming April is the amount of the settlement based on last year's sales. But our most recent payout was $59 million. So the, there is always effort in the consensus revenue estimating group to ensure they're not anticipating more than is uh, you know realistic to uh, to count on and they so they they lowball those estimates to be safe and that should be the the overall tone of that memo reflects that well i was i was um not paying as much attention i guess to the immediate year's estimate as i wish just the, the material about the concern of future payment yeah. and yeah. i guess we actually, uh, some money is spent to underwrite the attorney general's continued oversight, participation, and I hope aggressive participation in this settlement. Do you, is that, is that correct? That's correct. There are two line items that are transferred directly out of the key fund to other agencies for compliance purposes. So one is the funding that goes to the attorney general's office. And the other is funding that um, supports the work at the Department of Revenue to track the, the sales of cigarettes. So, um, I, you know, the, there's an argument that could be made that based on statute, those functions should be coming out of state general fund because they are not authorized in statute to be transferred out of the key fund. I don't think we've ever tried to make that issue it simply because they are directly related to the settlement. Um, I would be interested in the thoughts this cabinet has come June when we have um, the next round of budget discussions, but it, it's important work that's necessary to maintain the terms of the settlement. So it has, well, you know, over time that those dollars have been taken from the key fund. Um, it, it totals about $2 million a year for compliance work. Well, I think that that's, that would be something good uh, to include in our budget discussions. I guess, I, I don't know how their cabinet members feel. My feeling would be that, um, my concern would be that indeed the money is buying a relatively aggressive oversight and involvement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not, not so much that we shouldn't be spending that money, uh, as much as I hope, I hope it isn't just being. Um, I hope it's buying specific services that we need to maintain the settlement. So, yeah, um, I'm gonna. Uh, I just before I ask if there are more questions, so I'm not shutting anybody off. I'm showing a phone number uh, muted here that I'm kind of thinking might be Deanne's way of getting on, but I'm not sure who that is. It's not showing a name. It ends with four, five, four, and it's muted. Lindsay, or that, uh, there we go. Who is this? Kim, this is Deanne. I, we're having to go through a few steps for me to be unmuted and muted, but this is Deanne. Well, I'm sorry you had trouble. I saw you and then you got kicked off somehow. So I'm sorry you've had that trouble, but I'm glad to know you can participate. So- um, Well, thank you, I'm here. Okay. And we've got Dr. Smith, so I think we have a quorum, but let's continue here. Um, further questions uh, and really uh, thanks as, um, <clears throat> as has been expressed for the work to get us this far into the budget. And um, any, any other questions from cabinet members for Melissa about this topic? My, my impression is at this point, um, the reception has been okay by the legislature for these recommendations. Is that I'll say so far so good, Kim? This is Melissa. It, it, I think I think there's uh, appreciation for the importance of the the program served by the CIF and understanding that um, you know our process is is trustworthy. And um, so I I have. 
I have faced a, a, an overall warm reception, which is really nice. And, um, I don't want to hold this up here, but I keep asking strange questions. In the, in the report, uh, the, the budget document, the, I think I read somewhere uh, that we were required to spend 30% of our money on uh, ages zero to five or something. Just, I, so I don't know where I read that. It might've been the tobacco settlement update, but somewhere, I, is the legislature aware that we have really targeted uh, zero to five with, with yes. most of this money? Okay. Yes, I think, you know, the, and John can attest to this. And if Monica has made it on, um, I, my mouse has frozen, so I can't, um, I can't change what I see on screen. Um, I would say there is awareness in the legislature that stems from the battle over whether or not to securitize tobacco funding about the, the work we do. And I think the, the reporting that we provide um, serves us well. I think the, the level of, of accountability and transparency and openness that we have about the work we do and, and the, the focus of this cabinet, the, the blueprint for early childhood as a framework, um, now, now having this the all in for Kansas kids strategic plan for early childhood, I, I think all of that serves to to underscore the the care and the thought that goes into the investments that we make. And and honestly, that when when you really listen to the questions and concerns that get expressed by lawmakers. We often, the easy choice is to assume it's political, you know, battling over who's in charge and who wants what. But at heart, it's often just a quest for better information. And when you can provide answers to the questions being asked in um, a, a, an open, honest way, I, I think it serves, serves the programs well uh, yeah. to be able to have that dialogue. So I, I, it's just, you know, kudos to the, the research teams that back us up of um, Wichita State and KU, the staff that, that works throughout the year, um, I, Amy and, and her, her interaction with our grant recipients and, and all, of, all of those things that we do to ensure that we can produce reporting to back up this slate of investments serves us well when it comes time to talk about funding. As long as we're not asking for more state general fund money, and yeah. then that becomes a, a different question. But, um, you know, it, it's important to continually note that our funds entirely depend on the sale of cigarette products and that that isn't something that necessarily um, at this level can be relied on forever because certainly the, the big tobacco companies have been exploring other forms of, of products that would circumvent the terms of the settlement. Well, I guess my um, kind of what was lurking behind that last question was just a sense I have that the whole early child care issue in Kansas is on the minds of uh, many communities, and my guess is, therefore, on the minds of many legislators, and I think positioning ourselves as somebody who's doing something about it uh, would be helpful, and uh, I think uh, that's all I wanted to be sure that, that they understood that much of our investment activity is in early childhood, and that yeah. may be a positive thing. Uh, not because I don't think six through 18 should be <laughs> supported either, right. but I think right now the political reality is there's just a lot of attention on the child care issue and that uh, it, it serves us well to be a, a significant player in that work. So, okay. I, Kim, I've tried to position us as the connector and the convener and, and that we can plug in needs with, you know, the, the appropriate agencies to help resolve things. And, and um, because, you know, 
the work does reside in other places, but um, the more that we can bring people together, the, the, the better off we'll all be when we know um, where to turn for assistance. So yes, that's, that's very true. And there has never been more um, focus on the childcare needs of, of um, our state than right now. And we have seen um, what the Kansas Leadership Center would call unusual allies come to the table, which we welcome with open arms and are trying to work with. So the business community is tuned in. Um, the the it, it, It's just really, uh, even some of the, the um, nonprofit funders in the state have turned attention to some child care priorities. So yeah, it's it's a big issue. It may be one of those opportunity moments. So I appreciate your your work to grasp the opportunity. Um, let me just one more check. Any kind of financial budget questions? Uh, Looks like we... John has a question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, this is John Wilson with Kansas Action for Children. I wanted to just layer on to what Melissa said uh, in and say that um, I do think that there is strong bipartisan support generally for investments in early learning and early childhood development. And yet I also still see the need to educate lawmakers about the, the particular child care crisis we face in our state. And I know there's a lot of folks um, watching this um, meeting that are in the in the field as practitioners or supporters of those who are in child care. And I think we were we will always need people to remind lawmakers that parents can't pay more and providers can't make less. And with every two years uh, seeing new House members, every four years seeing potentially new Senate members, there's going to be that constant need because I still see people who think that, uh, you know, whatever, the private sector can just step in and donate more money and all of a sudden we have a better functioning childcare system. So it's, it's going to take all of us. And I think one of the things, should we ever have to have the conversation that we need actual state general fund dollars to support the uh, cabinet's work. I think the strong work of grantees around the state make it more likely that lawmakers wouldn't uh, kind of let the funding go away. They would find a way to support it um, because no, no lawmaker wants to be the one to shut down centers or to uh, minimize home visiting services or parent education services. So. Uh, it, as, as Melissa said, we have our evaluators and our staff and our researchers helping it, our, our good rapport with lawmakers. And then I think the final component of that is the strong work of grantees around the state. Thanks, John. Any other comments or questions? This is Deanne Graham. I do have a question. Uh, Melissa, can you touch on, uh, and I apologize, you probably mentioned this already um, before I was able to get on, but the, the two new budget line items are those figures, are they removed from other parts of the budget or are those additions to the budget in this fiscal year? So um, good question, Deanne, this is Melissa. I would, I, they, it's the rearranging of the, the line items in the CIF. We, we did receive $500,000 more funding um, from the key fund transfer. So, um, you know, if it helps to look at that as the, the capacity for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, that's an easy one. The 1.4 million in the new infrastructure line item and the increase in maternal child health home visiting and the increase in the early childhood block grants, um, uh, 1 million of that comes from um, capacity freed up by the recommendations we made to fund four line items through alternative sources to the CIF. And so the largest of those is $3.7 million or $3.8 million that went, it transferred out of the, the CIF. It was a pass through for children's mental health waiver services. That is a, a type of service provided through the Medicaid program. That, that waiver refers to the Medicaid waiver. So the recommendation was fund that through your larger package of funding for Medicaid. And I believe the agency had to ask for a budget enhancement. And I do know that that request was made. And I know in the governor's budget, steps were taken to ensure those services receive funding. Um, the other 
line items were much smaller amounts, um, 57,000 for the infant toddler hearing aid bank. KDHE assured us they could absorb that program in, in their existing, that that stopping that transfer would not stop the hearing aid bank from, from providing hearing aids to infants and toddlers, that those services can continue. Um, so it, yes, there are certain line items that no longer appear on the CIF budget. We retain the funds to be able to do some new things with them. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yep. All right. Okay, well, with that, let's, um, let's move back up to consider the minutes of our December 3rd meeting. Um, if I can have, um, see, I've still got everybody here. Um, is there a motion to approve the final draft of the minutes as Diaga has sent them out? Hi, Kim, it's Delise. I so move. Thanks, Delise. Is there a second? This is Lietta, I second. All right, I've got Elise and Lietta. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, if you would, um, I, there's John. Uh, I, can see, I can see four of us. I can't see Tyler or Deanne. Um, so all in favor, first uh, raise your hands, those that we can see, and I'm seeing uh, those four hands that I mentioned. Uh, Deanne, are you in favor of approving the minutes? Yes, I am. Uh, Dr. Smith, are you in favor of approving the minutes? Yes, I approve the minutes. All right. Are there any opposed? I don't think there's anybody left, but I'll ask if there's anybody opposed. All right. It, the, the minutes are approved. Thank you for that. And Diaga, thank you. Those were kind of complicated minutes. Uh, I appreciate uh, your revisions on them. Um, we, we decided to put in all the, um, the web links. I don't know if that was necessary, but I just, I guess we kind of both thought that for the permanent record, it was probably good to have those in writing instead of just an electronic link that might disappear someday. So those are in there. All right. Um, preschool development grant update. Melissa, it's back to you. Oh, um, so thank you, Kim. I just wanted to brief the, the cabinet on the work going on with, with as we round the corner on year two of this grant and begin planning for year three. Um, we have some exciting progress to report. So the first is the Kansas Future Fellows, which the grant has funded a fellowship and we have, I believe it's 11, um, Stars. I mean, these folks are from all different sorts of interesting backgrounds from across the state. We put together a fellowship to meet. Um, the first meeting was in September. We've got um, consultants helping support the work of it, it. This is future focused anticipatory governance in action. So um, it, the, the point is to have a group that's really focused on the future and, and where we might see ourselves in 20 years, because we end up very, I think coming out of this, this period, this last two years where our focus has been on today's crisis, uh, I, it's been really hard to, to maintain the ability to look up from the work going on to deal with with the, the things erupting around us here and now and, and look forward at what's down the road. And so we pulled together this group, we've reported on membership. There's a, a page on our cabinet website that details um, the folks that are participating in this. But um, I just wanna report they've met, I think three times, um, they, they've met September, they met before Christmas, are meeting again, and, and it will culminate in what we're calling the Future Forum, which will be held in May. So um, preparations are underway for the forum to be held the week of May 16th through the 20th. They each have a 
project they've they've outlined for themselves and energy is high and and nobody has missed a meeting and um they they're really bonding with each other and looking for ways to support each other's projects and find partnerships and really bring different perspectives to their their thinking um I, and reports are that there is lots of connection among the, the fellowship class outside of the scheduled meetings, that they are really um, working collaboratively with each other and, and checking in, which, which is kind of a dream for this, that, that we create that, that group of champions for the work that goes on. Um, we've had visiting instructors that that have led some guided exercises and future focused thinking, um, which has really, I think, invigorated all of the activities. So we will um, be planning the future forum that will include um, local activities that each fellow coordinates in their own community. And then we will have a gathering in Topeka on Thursday, May 19th. The keynote at that will be provided by New York Times reporter and the founder of Solutions Journalism Movement, David Bornstein. Um, this is, so there's work underway to, to lay some groundwork with, with media leaders um, and include options for meaningful policymaker and private industry engagement at our future forum. We have initial efforts underway. We're so excited about what's already come from this that we're exploring ways to grow this program next year and um, engage year two of the Kansas Future Fellows. In terms of the career pathway and workforce registry, um, the, the, I just remind that the goal of the career pathway is to establish a shared foundation by which early childhood care and education um, professionals that the child care profession know how to both enter the field and how to advance in their career and to help align the wealth of different opportunities for professional development um, that exist across the state to make it easier for an individual in the profession to choose the, the professional development opportunities that are most meaningful to them and the, the path that they have um, charted for themselves um, to grow in their profession. So this is, um, this is a vital tool in our toolkit. It, it will help us with recruitment and retention efforts. And um, it, 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 it's a challenge. It will always be a challenge but we know that the crisis point that we're at um, creates an opportunity to um, think differently about our approach to things. The pathway is intended to set an equitable structure for the layering of stipends and incentives and compensation increases in the system. Um, so it, it will be a framework that we will be able to leverage when opportunities arise. The draft of our career pathway has, is complete and we're now in the phase of sharing out with um, stakeholder groups such as childcare providers, the workforce development advisory group that is tied to agency work, um, two and four year higher education and um, um, training in infant toddler specialists among a few of the, the types of groups that we've, we've been presenting to. Those presentations are designed to solicit feedback on the plan as it currently exists. And it, we have not just the, the elements of it outlined, but we have a graphic representation. So it's, it's both the content and the, the, the communication kit that we are trying to sand the rough edges and make sure that there is understanding of the goals and that people can see themselves in the career pathway. And what that means is we have, we have a wealth of different programs that, that all lead to careers and, in, in early childhood and child care. You might pursue a path that takes you through higher ed 
two-year degree, four-year degree, master's degree, PhD, all levels, there are career opportunities each step of the way. You also can enter the profession without ever going to a, a, a two or four-year college. You can earn certifications and you can um, do professional development trainings that, that will help lead you um, through um, you know, different levels of attainment and quality improvement. We also have a core of child care providers that have served the state well. They've, they have risen up to, to meet all of the licensing requirements as things have been put in place. They have cared for kids for any number of years, done so in a beautiful, loving way, and um, their experience needs to be honored. So we have a, a, a piece of the pathway is intended to be uh, to lead to a certificate of mastery that that honors their experience because we don't want to shut people out by saying, well, nice that you've been doing this for 12 years and um, the parents whose kids you care for love you and the kids are successful, but that doesn't mean much in our pathway because you don't have higher ed. That is the wrong message to send. And we wanna honor um, all different levels of experience and, and commitment to the profession. So we are in the, the, the stage of putting finishing touches on the, the pathway. That pathway is connected to the workforce registry project, which um, I mentioned, we, we are finalizing the RFP to go out to, to solicit a vendor. Um, that process has involved engagement with the Department of Administration and the Kansas Information Technology Office. And um, certainly DCF has been a partner at the table as they are, are um, providing funding through their um, child care development block grant pandemic relief funds um, for this, this upgrade to our system. Um, so it, it's been a big project. We've, we've had to coordinate across multiple state agencies. Our own setup at Department of Education has involved their fiscal division. So all of that coordination has been um, quarterbacked by um, Hannah McGahey on our team and a, an outside consultant called Resultant that specializes in work like this. And we have had a really smooth process. So we are excited that with the RFP going out um, and a timeline to get to um, registry launch by the end of 2022. At this point, we appear to be on track for that. The um, needs assessment, we, you know we did our comprehensive needs assessment work in 2019 and came up with a, a um, serendipitous um, baseline that, you know, who knew we would need to have a baseline to compare pre-pandemic to um, pandemic and post-pandemic, but um, here we are. So we updated as, as one of our PDG activities, we did a 2020 needs assessment update. And we, of course, are engaged in a 2021 update to see what, um, what where we are, what the um, ongoing effects of, of COVID have been, but also, um, you know, taking a look at the, the role our, our collective work has played in helping begin to, to make progress on um, our strategic plan and um, how we've, we've fared with, with all things considered. So we hope uh, the goal is to complete that by May of 22. So um, ideally at our June meeting, I'll have an update on that for you that's more specific. Um, we have been with PDG funds doing work that's known as adaptive technical assistance, and we've got an annual report from that team. This is a broad reaching resource offered to communities through the renewal grant resources. Um, it's in partnership with um, KUCPPR team members, community level organizations, um, 
And it, basically what it is is a team of folks coming in at the request of communities that are unsure of where to start when it comes to meeting the early childhood needs in their community. So it's a way of organizing a community team around that, that topic. Um, the team provides, our team provides tiered support based on what the community needs. And we help make referrals to other organizations and resources that exist, um, help connect to trainings and other content specific types of technical assistance. Um, so it, some of the organizations that have helped support are, are groups like Child Care Aware of Kansas. Engagement has really just been word of mouth. And this is part of where, you know, I might, I, I, I tend to get phone calls from um, city managers and economic development um, executive directors and, and people, people that aren't in our sector. And Usually it's the TA, the adaptive TA team that um, has been useful in connecting. So I can tell you that the city of Emporia, the city of Manhattan, the city of Dodge City, there, there are communities across the state that reached out saying, we know we have issues, we know we have needs, but we don't know where to begin. And it's it's been helpful to connect the adaptive TA team to, to help triage and assess what's needed so they can point them in the right direction of those um, organizations and agencies that exist to, to help support. Um, so in the annual report that's being finalized, there are some highlights emerging. Um, there have, are 263 total community partners representing 38 different Kansas communities that have participated. Nine childcare providers that were not able to receive a subgrant through PDG, we actually connected with them through the adaptive TA to, to help connect them to the resources they were asking for. So they weren't a good fit for the, the goals of the grant and the criteria that, that the, the grants required, but we saw opportunity to still help meet the needs that they were expressing through their application. So that's something we're pretty proud of. Um, the, the, um, training resources it involve things like how to use the ASQ um, or find trauma-informed training for staff, um, taking a deeper dive into what the needs assessment data means for a given community. Uh, so basically helping communities know how to process all of that, that information um, in their decision-making process. Um, we have provided support for determining the steps to strengthen community level collaboration. Um, how do you put together a team that reflects different sectors in a given community? So local government and school districts and, and higher ed and business and philanthropy. How do you get them all around the table if you've never done that before? Um, we have provided assistance um, by to connect programs to help writing grants, that, that is one of those issues that, that not everybody knows how to write a successful grant application. So connecting to grant writer capacity has been another goal and um, just helping direct people to existing resources, webinars that are online or publicly available resources that folks might not know about. Um, so just working in that role of connector. And finally, um, I wanna focus just a moment on the year three planning that's underway. We are due to turn in a scope of work for the activities we hope to accomplish in year three of our PDG grants and the budget that goes with it, all of our agency Partners have submitted their budget requests, and we are in. We were we're finalizing um, the information that needs to be submitted to our federal project officer, and um, look forward to a, a transition from year two to year three. That that annually, the anniversary is um, April 29th is the end of the current grant year and, and April 30th is the start of the first grant year. We were given 
capacity to carry forward funding from year one into year two that was unspent due to the pandemic and the timelines that got upended. And we are um, probably going to have that same bit of grace um, year two to year three because of the ongoing effects. Um, the work that we anticipate will include support for the initiatives that have been underway in year one and year two. So continued support for the ages stages questionnaire, adaptive TA, our early childhood integrated data system and our workforce um, efforts. We have some agency led initiatives we continue to support. So that's the care coordination work at KDHE, programs like Bridges and Supporting You reflect that um, effort to engage parents and coordinate care and make it easier for them to navigate and, and connect to the resources they need. Um, we are excited to be offering another $3 million worth of subgrant renewals for communities and organizations across Kansas. We will provide some support for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library as we make that transition um, to get to the fiscal year 23 startup, um, assuming our budget is honored. And then we will be launching a final round of kindergarten readiness subgrants. Those applications actually will open next week on February 11th. So that's um, help rounding up kindergartners and, and helping helping future kindergartners and their families uh, make a successful transition from whatever programs they may be in to what they need um, to connect to and um, just help kids launch in kindergarten successfully. So again, um, I, I will invite our, our PDG agency partners um, if I have misstated something or left something out you want to highlight, this is a great time to invite you to add to the update on PDG. And um, then we will invite cabinet discussion if, if you have any questions or comments. Not seeing any uh, or hearing any, Melissa. So, we'll see great. if the cabinet, mem cabinet members have some comments. Welcome, Monica. I appreciate Monica's joined the, the meeting here. Well, Amanda, Amanda Peterson came on video, so I thought she was going to say something. So, I, I hesitated a minute. She's saying no. All right. Any questions from uh, cabinet members about the PDG update? Melissa, I, I guess I have another question. Okay. Is that, is that grant renewed beyond renewable beyond three years, or do we know? No, it will not be. Okay. So that's why we we started thinking about midway through. Thoughts have turned. So this summer we began thinking about long term picture. Um, how do we maintain the 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 momentum and and support for the the programs that we are. Um, working on, and I, I think I'm I'm feeling good that we are able to leverage other forms of federal funding for part of this. We will hopefully be able to leverage some of the tobacco settlement funding through the CIF, and then that will have a minimal impact on state level general fund support. Um, that's usually the hot button when federal funds start new programs, the state is then left holding the bag to support. So we have been very mindful of the need to ensure that the work that we start is work that we will be able to sustain. Well, I, I was aware that we had done those, those actions relative to the, but nothing's changed in terms of the renewability, so. No. Okay. No. Anything else? Any questions? There was a lot there. All right. Uh, it looks like we're ready for Debbie to report on the Early Childhood Advisory Council. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kim. Um, yes, I'd like to be able to continue to give you updates about what's happening. I just want to remind everyone that might be listening in that the uh, Early Childhood Recommendations Panel serves as an advisory group to the Kansas Children's Cabinet in its role as the Early Childhood Advisory Council. And we do meet on the third Friday of every month in the mornings from 9 to 1130. And those meetings can all be found um, on the Children's Cabinet website at this link that is provided here. So we had um, an early childhood governance summit that we um, put on for the first time. So on January 21st, um, nine groups from the Kansas Early Childhood Governance Structure convened for the first governance summit. And this took place during the uh, designated time slot of the regular monthly um, recommendations panel meeting. And we did have 20 or no, 75 total attendees. So we were pleased with that. And the purpose of this summit was for each group to share information on their purpose, to um, share information on their work and progress to date and really celebrate that work. And then any work or goals planned uh, that they have coming up for 2022, as Melissa pointed out, as we get ready to transition into our final year of the PDG grant. And so each group had 10 minutes to present their information. And the goals for this were also to allow the uh, participants to discuss ongoing opportunities on how to best collaborate to accomplish the goals and strategies of the All In for Kansas Kids Strategic Plan and to identify any potential topics that they might see the need to elevate to the panel at some time in the future. So we were um, glad to have Melissa and Amanda join us to give a welcome address as well as Melissa was able to share out some of this budget information that she's touched on today. And then Sarah Gardner from the KUCPPR team also joined us to share information on the PDG funding guidelines and the parameters on how those monies can be spent and requests um, for some of those monies from these groups. So the nine groups that participated were the recommendations panel, the family leadership team, the state ICC, the child care systems improvement team, home visiting leadership, links to quality, the governor's behavioral health services, planning councils, children's subcommittee, uh, the Maternal Child Health Council and the Workforce Development Advisory Group. And so during their presentations, uh, group leaders were able to highlight information on their meaningful work uh, that they are doing to enhance services to children and families, organizations and agencies throughout our mixed delivery uh, system of early childhood in Kansas. And so they're accomplishing this work through initiatives, professional development, the expansion of services, data sharing, various communication platforms, um, community, family, and child care provider engagement activities, and then learning from those uh, shared stories and experiences during those activities to move their work forward. They're um, do, working on improvements in telehealth, uh, improving child care licensing, regulatory standards, and program quality accountability. And they also shared challenges that they are facing, uh, such as the child care workforce uh, shortages and burnout, as Melissa has touched on, and then ongoing pandemic related issues, and then navigating resources across the system, uh, both among the groups and then also helping families uh, to navigate those resources, which is very challenging. And a few of the goals for 2022 that they shared are um, the, the importance for public awareness and messaging campaigns, the expansion of counties being served throughout Kansas, and then increasing services to address uh, the behavioral health challenges that are being brought on by the pandemic. And so I felt like the uh, opportunity to participate in the summit was very well, well received by these groups as I coordinated with them uh, for the planning of it. And I received feedback since then that uh, connections have started to take place, which we're happy to hear because that was one of the um, outcomes that we hope to see happen 
Um, so between in the individuals and groups uh, in attendance. So those connections are happening. We're going to continue to follow up with them and encourage them to contact me to help make any uh, other future connections that they might uh, see the need for. And so this was recorded live and it's available for viewing on the cabinet website. A collaboration survey has also been sent out by the KUCPPR team to uh, the participants and their group members. And those results will be shared out when they're completed. And then a graphic live recording has been done by the KUCPPR team as well. And it's going to be available to view on the website. And it's uh, kind of a fun way to look to capture all of that in just a, a snapshot. And so we feel like it was a successful event and we hope that all of the participants felt like it was a good use of their time and that uh, anyone listening in that wants to go to watch that, you know, will do so. The panel did meet briefly after the summit for their regular monthly meeting and they took care of general housekeeping items and then Melissa and Amanda spoke to the members to provide some additional clarity and a timeline for the current work groups to finalize the development of their proposed recommendations in those work groups. You've heard me talk about these for a few months now and they're listed here. And so uh, the plan is if approved uh, by the full panel at their March meeting, uh, you can possibly see, um, anticipate to see those uh, recommendations be brought to you for consideration at your next meeting in April. I also did receive an application from Paula Branazor to join the panel. Paula is new in her position with the Bureau of Family Health at KDHE as director, and uh, she would serve on the panel in the role of a state agency representative. And so I am happy to answer any questions you might have on this information I've shared and then turn it back over to Kim for a unanimous consent to accept Paula's application for membership. Any questions for Debbie? That sounds like that was a great meeting. Uh, that list of groups uh, just tells us how, um, uh, you know, the, the benefits of, a, of a, a rich system and also the, the fragmentation of a system. So I think it's great to have those opportunities where they can all come together. So. And this well, is Amanda you. Peterson, and I was hopping in not with a question, but with a public kudos for Debbie and for all of the groups who took time to come and present and for the staff who made it happen, because exactly as you said, you know, we have so much great work happening in our state. And also, uh, we know that it takes work to be able to coordinate and help make sure mm -hmm. that people are aware of who else is doing the work. So they did a great job of uh, connecting beforehand and really being able to explain and lay out the purpose of the event and laying the groundwork for continued collaboration in the future. Thanks, Amanda. Any, any other comments or questions for Debbie before we take action on the action item? If not, uh, do I hear a motion to appoint Paula Branzior? Am I saying that right? Uh, as, a, as a member of the recommendations panel, is there a motion to do that? Monica Murnian, so moved. And Monica moves. Is there a second? John Wilson, I'll second that. John will second. Um, if all in favor uh, would say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Well, I let the record show that all, uh, I believe we have seven members uh, voted aye at this point. And uh, we'll welcome her to the panel. Um, and uh, Debbie, thank you. I'm, I am warned by Melissa that uh, while this meeting will be I assume relatively short based on where we are on the agenda, um, <clears throat> that the next meeting could be rather long. So <laughs> this hour that we're saving you, uh, be prepared uh, cabinet members because we're anticipating uh, recommendations from Debbie's group and uh, several other action items. So uh, just, just reserve your, um, uh, what I want to say, your uh, discussion ability and your uh, decision-making talents for the April meeting. So I would say, Kim, I would echo that. April and June are probably the two most important cabinet meetings in terms of decision-making. So um, forewarned. Um, yeah, so so we're just to the agency update. Right. And agenda. Okay, who, 
I, is there a list of people who, uh, there is, which always helps me because them, these names change from time to time. And I, it's hard to keep track of who all's on here from what agency. So, uh, however, Amanda, we, we've got you first and I know you. So uh, would you lead off here with any updates? I'd love to. This is Amanda Peterson, and we've got a couple of updates from the Kansas State Department of Education. Um, one, I want to take a, a moment to thank Ms. Wilbur, who has served as our uh, agency's parents' as teachers state leader for about the past five years. Ms. has moved on to some really exciting professional opportunities, and I know that she'll continue to do great things for the field of home visiting. Um, but she left us in a really terrific position as we prepare for their next round of Kansas Parents as Teachers grants. As a reminder, those are Children's Initiatives Fund funded grants that are allocated to the Kansas State Department of Education. And we in turn allocate them to uh, about 64 Kansas Parents as Teachers affiliates in the state. Some of those are individual school districts and others of them are consortiums. Uh, NIST led some really terrific work with a group of stakeholders over the summer. We've been calling that our Kansas Parents as Teachers Think Tank. And they uh, gave a lot of thought to the process of how we allocate those grant awards to decide who gets how much money. Because as Melissa shared earlier, that, that has been a flat amount of funding for the past several years. Um, and so we made the determination that for the 2022-2023 school year, grantees can uh, expect the same amount of funding that they've received in previous years, unless any grantees request uh, less funding than they have in the past or unless there's an unexpected uh, increase in the allocation from the state. Um, so those grant applications are now available and grantees are working to get them complete. As I shared uh, at our last meeting in November, the Kansas State Department of Education determined that in the school finance formula, we'll have the opportunity moving forward to fund three-year-old students who are enrolled in approved programs and meet certain criteria. Uh, we've funded four-year-old students uh, in that way for many years. That used to be called the four-year-old at risk program, and now it's called preschool aged at risk. This is a really big deal. Uh, it's due to the work of many folks to both make sure that our school finance formula could, uh, could have that change and also to make sure that our state had the revenue to support it. Um, so right now, districts are in the process of completing those applications so that we can verify whether they meet program requirements. And if anybody is curious as to what those program requirements are, they can go to ksde.org and click on E for early childhood and take a look at our preschool programming webpage where we lay out those requirements for approved programs. Um, we, Melissa talked earlier about the ages and stages questionnaires, the ASQ, which we've adopted in our state as our kindergarten readiness snapshot. That means that all elementary schools are required to partner with parents of incoming kindergartners to complete those questionnaires. Last year, we provided additional flexibility to allow schools to begin doing that in the springtime so that they could incorporate them into kindergarten roundup or other orientation opportunities, and that was very well received. So we're again offering that opportunity this year, and we've had a number of schools already indicate that they would like to do that um, so that they can be collecting that information from families right away and then providing them with uh, things that they can be doing over the summer to support their children's readiness to begin school. Um, we also have our application uh, now open for school districts and accredited private school systems to apply for our Kansans Can Star Recognition Program. Um, so that is an opportunity for schools to be recognized for the things that Kansans have told us that they value, which includes kindergarten readiness. There's a rubric where communities and schools can do a self-assessment to see where they're at, um, and schools will be working on that between now and June 30th when they're due. And then the last piece uh, that I'm excited about, so our, our Association of Service Centers has come together to create some peer learning opportunities for our, uh, our, our educators and, and other staff who work with young children and their families uh, and also our administrators. So those early childhood professional learning communities are happening three times throughout the year, and the next one is next week Friday from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm A. Peterson KS, and I've been tweeting about it. Uh, so if you are a person in Kansas who works with young children, uh, next week, Barbara Ganaway from Greenbush will be presenting on family engagement, and it's going to be a really terrific conversation. So I'm really excited that those partners have come together in that way um, to create that opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, or I can hand it off to Kelly Mark. All right. Amanda, this is Monica. Um, Hi, Monica. Um, I, to all of you on the call, I just want everybody to know what a game changer the three-year-old at-risk change is. 
and you know it's a beautiful collision of policy and actual practice little kids getting to go to preschool now that didn't get to go it it's it's a big deal in Kansas and even though Amanda will say it was a whole team of people um she did a lot of figuring and uh, a lot of math to to make that happen so um thanks from all the three-year-olds in Kansas Very exciting. Monica, I'd love to echo, it's Lietta, I'd love to echo just the kudos. Amanda, you're doing an amazing job and you're everywhere, everywhere you're popping up, sharing the good news and the important advocacy work on behalf of kids that really don't have a voice at the table unless we do this. So it's not going unnoticed. Thank you, Amanda. And thanks, Monica, for pointing that out. And as both of you uh, said, it's a whole team effort. So I'm, I'm glad to get to be the person with the, the Twitter account who gets to talk about the good work going on. Okay, well, uh, I have Amy Meek next. Amy? Good morning, Amy Meek, um, Early Childhood Director with the Children's Cabinet. And I have a few um, cabinet updates in addition to what Melissa shared. Um, first is our community-based child abuse prevention um, Grants, we kicked off a grantee meeting, um, or kicked off our year with the grantee meeting on January 13th. Um, this was a great opportunity to introduce our new grantees. Um, welcome back our previous um, grantees as well. We went over uh, reporting guide, um, guidance and what to expect for the year and um, evaluation expectations as well to make sure everybody's uh, well prepared for um, data collection and um, what that will look like um, for this year. And then also went over our technical assistance and training plan. Um, we have two primary areas of focus, um, which are partnering with individuals with lived experience of prevention services and identifying and addressing um, inequities. We're gonna be providing a webinar series to, um, which will be kind of like a toolkit that'll put the concepts of identifying and addressing disparities and also engaging voices with lived experiences into action. Um, so we'll um, also provide some opportunity for grantees um, to connect and um, share what work, what's worked for them as well. Um, next, um, which aligns really well with our prevention um, work with CBCAP is our Driving Families Safer Children um, work that involves um, a Kansas team um, of partners um, on our Kansas team are individuals with lived experience of the child welfare or prevention services system. Um, we also have uh, representatives from the Kansas Department for Children and Families, Kansas Children's Service League, Kansas State Department of Education, the Kansas Department for Health and Environment, um, and also the University of Kansas School of Social Welfare and the University of Kansas Center for Public Partnerships and Research. So that comprises our, our team in Kansas, and we just celebrated one year of um, this work this month. So we're starting our second year um, and it's focused on creating a more just and equitable child and family well-being system. And our Kansas teams aligned with the focus of the Thriving Families um, Safer Children Guiding Principles which includes supporting people with lived experience as leaders in this work, um, promoting race equity and co-creating solutions with communities. Um, we want these solutions to, that can better support and um, provide resources for children and families. Um, so before they come into contact with agencies like Child Protective Services. So we spent the first part of, 20, um, first part of this work in 2021 developing our Kansas objectives and action steps. Um, we've participated and continue to participate in National um, Thriving Family Safer Children TA support, which includes um, the 22 cohort states. Um, so we're able to hear from other states and learn from them as well. Um, we also have TA from other national partners um, that's provided uh, monthly. Those are Casey Family Programs, the Annie E. Casey, um, also Prevent Child Abuse America and the Children's Bureau. So we have lots of TA going on. And then also Kansas is um, one of seven states that are participating in the Burns Institute Action Network. Um, this is focusing on community-centered structural well-being framework. Um, so lots of good stuff going on. And um, 
we're also um, excited that Casey Family Programs awarded us uh, some grant money um, in November, which helps us to put our plan into action. Um, so we are um, in the process of, of doing some of these things, um, but this will continue in 2022. Um, and KU CPPR is supporting our team and putting um, uh, uh, using this funding and putting a lot of these things into action. There's been um, engagement or, with organizations and communities in Kansas um, to hear um, from historically excluded voices about needs um, and what could be um, provided in their community to support both existing community efforts and um, new ways, um, grassroots efforts or other things that um, are needed in their communities. Um, conducting research of community level barriers and disparities um, and service access for communities through interviewing uh, community members and identifying upstream approaches um, that can be used to prevent unnecessary child welfare involvement. We've also had a, a smaller uh, sub team that's been working on statewide messaging um, for our efforts and we have um, kicked off a new web page um, which will be updated um, as we um, put more things into action with our plan. But you can find that webpage at asthrivingfamilies.org. Um, and it's also um, lives on our um, cabinet webpage is um, also a link there. So asthrivingfamilies.org. And um, we have um, some of the things that I've um, talked about on there, but we'll be also updating with um, as we um, continue with our plan. And then lastly, with that funding, we're gonna be creating a accountability agent cohort of community members. This will be aimed at engaging grassroots and community led organizations um, by and for historically excluded populations. So this core cohort will support efforts to fill gaps in represented um, voices across the state, also represent the needs and interests of the communities that they serve. Um, we also wanna congratulate the Kansas Children's Service League who has awarded a Prevent Child Abuse America grant, um, which aligns um, very well with this Thriving Families Initiative. Their grant year started February 1, and it's gonna be focused also on community engagement and building on the work um, CPBR started through the Casey Funds. Um, they're going to be hosting 40 community cafes across the state, um, hoping to reach 250 individuals. And then KU is going to help analyze that data from those uh, cafes to identify trends and needs and challenges in communities. And then um, lastly, um, there's going to be an opportunity for community members to actually apply for some mini grants to put some of those um, things into action. And um, as Kim mentioned we're going to have a, a bigger meeting in April. We'll be bringing you some early childhood block grant um, funding recommendations. In December, we had 133 applications as part of our joint um, process with the Kansas um, State Department of Education's Kansas Preschool Pilot. Um, so the early childhood block grant and Kansas Preschool Pilot did a joint application and um, so we've spent the last four weeks um, reviewing those 133 applications, which was a big lift. And um, thanks to 24 or so reviewers um, that has helped with that process. So um, our next steps will be to um, pull all of that um, reviews and all the information that we've collected and try to um, work through then what, what would be our recommendations that we'll bring you in April. So that will keep us busy until then. And we'll be working with our partners at um, KSD on that, so. Okay. All right, thanks, Amy. And now let's have a moment, any questions for Amy? You wanna step there? I guess it was covered. All right, uh, Kelly from KDHE. Good morning, everyone. Kelly Mark, Acting Bureau Director of the Bureau of Family Health, the KDAG. So uh, my updates will be rather brief, but as you heard from Debbie Deer earlier, pa uh, Paula Brandazor is our new Early Care and Youth Programs Director. We are super excited to have her. She came on December 27th, so we are actively working and training her and um, really excited that she's with us. 
Um, I just wanted to say we're also really pleased to be a part of this larger early childhood system work that's happening across the state. Um, KDHE has its its role in all of those things that Melissa talked about earlier and the collaboration that's happening between not only our state agencies, but our partners across the state is it's really exciting and it's, you know, a higher level than I've ever experienced before. So we're so happy to have our role in that. Um, with that said, we have been doing our part, educating our legislators on the work that's happening and we'll continue to do that as needed. We are also, um, also really, really pleased about the budget increase that Melissa talked about for universal home visiting. We are ready to go um, if that gets approved and we have um, great plans to use that money very efficiently and wisely, not only to increase the reach of our program, but really to revamp that program and get a robust evaluation plan in place for that program. So super excited about that. Um, our childhood licensing program is working on some priority regulation changes right now, um, working on getting those through the formal process. I did want to um, announce that we have a brand new online regulation suggestion form. So our regulated community can go in real time and offer what um, regulation suggestion changes they have for us. Um, we're pulling every single one of those down and looking at them and adding them to our list as we continually um, review our regulations and, and keep up with the needs of our regulated community. Our live scan fingerprinting um, process that we have in partnership with DCF is moving right along. We are super excited about that work. Phase one has been completed and we've heard just really great success from the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Ys that participated in our pilot program. So we're fast moving into phase two and phase three um, of that program and really looking forward to the day when we have a statewide fingerprint network, um, really help our providers um, getting that process more streamlined. Um, so super excited about that work. And I also wanted to talk about um, a, a project that we have been funded for with PDG funds um, that we're really excited to announce. So we are going to start a partnership with the um, University of Kansas Lens program to do some more robust technical assistance and a certification program for child care providers um, to serve children with special health care needs. So we know that's a huge need across the system and very excited for this new project to try to fill some of that need. So I will stand for questions, but that's all the updates I have. Uh, Kelly, I guess I got one question. As we think about uh, putting the universal child care increase, should it happen in play, uh, will, will, one or, will that be open to several different models of home visiting? I said child care, home visiting, or will it be used for, you know, one or two models? What Can you help me with that issue? I sure can. And sorry, my cat's scratching on the door. So I hope that doesn't give you a lot of background noise. But so universal home visiting is a strength based approach. It's not an evidence based model. While we're re revamping our program, we are giving sites that deliver the universal home visiting the choice to use whatever model they want to, as long as that model includes the important things that we want to touch. So safe sleep, breastfeeding, mental health screening, social determinants of health screening, education topics that we need to have in there. Um, so we're giving them flexibility on which model they want to pick. They just need to make sure our visit to them follows a standardized method. So when you get a visit in Garden City and then you move to Topeka, you're going to get basically the same service. Okay. Well, thank you. Can I just yeah, intervene and, and just welcome Kelly to the team officially? Um, we, we said goodbye to Rachel at our last meeting, and I just wanted to make you feel very welcome, Kelly, as the um, Kansas Department of Health designee in your role. We, we, um, we appreciate, I mean, you've been part of the team for years in different capacity, but this is, this is exciting to be able to work with you. So welcome. Thank you. I do feel very welcome to work with such a great um, bunch of folks. So thank you, Melissa. Very good. Very good. Um, uh, Tanya from uh, DCF. I'm looking to see if that's who it is or we got somebody different here. Uh, it's it might be Dr. Hicks. I, I wasn't quite sure who would, would be re representing DCF today. So 
Um, Carla, if if you are here and Tanya is not, you are very welcome to, to represent the work of DCF right now. I am, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Carla Whiteside Hicks, Director of TANF and Early Childhood Programs for DCF. Um, and just a few updates to share. We are in the process of reviewing uh, proposals that we received in response to our family needs and preferences study. Um, it's a study that is intended to um, help us learn why families are making the child care decisions they are making. So why are they not choosing subsidy providers? Why are they choosing unlicensed care? Um, so um, we will use that information to guide our future decisions. So we have some assumptions and that's what we're using to, to drive the things that we are doing now, the, the things that we're funding, especially with our recovery dollars. But this will help us in our long-term planning for how we continue to support the child care system. Um, we are also working on a third round of sustainability grants um, to provide direct financial support for providers. So you should be hearing more details about that soon. Um, next, we are reviewing our existing agreements um, to determine if amendments are needed to enhance services that we are already providing. So we're looking at things like um, our technical assistance in the areas of mental health and um, supporting children with disabilities. We're also looking at a tiered and targeted supports um, to providers, including scholarships for professional development um, opportunities. Um, and then lastly, we are working with a marketing and branding firm to help us develop a marketing campaign to inform families and providers. Um, this is part of, it's one of the requirements of our CCDF funding, but um, also we want to make sure that that parents and providers are aware of all of these amazing things. I mean, just on this call, there's a lot that we have going on in the state of Kansas, and it's not really serving its purpose if families and providers don't know about the services that, that we have to offer. So you should see um, an intense marketing campaign to make sure that we are getting the word out and parents know where to go when they need information and providers know where they need to go um, when they need information so that we can have, um, as, as Melissa you know, is, is always pointing out to us, that we, we are connected in, in what we are doing and, and, and providing those services um, for our families. And that's all I have. Um, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, and this is Monica again. Go ahead, Monica. What a great list. A great list. Seems like a lot of direct services in there. And I really appreciate DCF looking at how to get those dollars to providers as quickly as possible through sustainability grants. Um, you know, the, the need is real. It is very, very real and it's today. So thank you for getting those dollars moving out to all of our communities and all the great people doing the work. And thanks for um, the things on that list that are, are really about you know, connecting with, with families and uh, getting them to the point where they know what is available. So thank you for that update and thanks for the work. Very good. Yes, thanks. For the report, uh, I see uh, Dr. Carla Wiscom is uh, out in the field today, but I guess she's able to uh, talk to us. She has one of those backdrops for people not, not seeing her, I think. I don't believe she's really out on a farm today or there'd be a little snow around. Carla? Thank you, Kim. I'm Carla Wiscom, Director of Academic Affairs at the Kansas Board of Regents. And the one thing that we're working on right now that is um, pertinent to early childhood is the revamping or revising, I guess, is a better word maybe, of the Promise Act. Um, the legislators are tweaking it to hopefully improve it. Um, it passed the Senate Ed Committee, but now it's going to the House Ed Committee. And I think what they're just trying to get some things worked out so that everybody's really clear on exactly what that is. Two other things at the Board of Regents that um, we're working on that maybe not exactly directly affects early childhood, but we're working on a statewide gen education package for all of our institutions so we would have the same gen ed. It's, it's become a barrier. We have 114 system-wide transfer courses, but unless the gen ed package transfers in, there's, there's still a, a barrier, so we're trying to remove that barrier. It'll, it'll be a year or two before it's implemented, but we're, we're making strong progress. And the other thing that we're concentrating is FAFSA completion. 
Kansas is one of the states that leaves um, federal aid unutilized. So we're trying to make sure that as many students as possible complete the FAFSA. So we had a little challenge and, and, and distributed awards, but we're also tracking that very closely so that maybe there are students that maybe didn't fill out the FAFSA before and see that that going to college or post-secondary in some way is, is a possibility through the funds that are available. So that is all I have, but I will stand for questions. Any questions for Carla? Thank you again for participating. I appreciate that update. Um, I'm aware Can, that Justice Wall submitted some material. Um, Melissa, were you going to present that? I am. I, I um, Let me first, Carla, express my excitement at the thought of a gen ed package that would help make it easier for people across the state. So um, kudos and, and um, we'll be anxious to hear updates as that evolves. Um, Hope Cooper messaged me that she she had to go at 1030 and did not have any Department of Correction updates. And then Justice Wall said the court is in session today. So he, he sent his regrets, but he also had a couple updates that I'll just go ahead and, and read. He said, effective January 1st, 2022, the court adopted amendments to Supreme Court Rule 174, which identifies the forms required in child of need of care proceedings to comply with federal and state law. The Office of Judicial Administration is developing informational materials to post on their website for those impacted by the rule change. Each year, OJA prints copies of the Child in Need of Care and Juvenile Offender Codes for Child Welfare Stakeholders to use. It's a compilation of the statutes and meant to be a quick resources. Those books are at the state printer now, and the books will be distributed through the network of CASA programs. For districts without a CASA program, and I believe he means court districts when he says that, um, those books will be distributed through the CSO office. Copies are also available on the judicial branch child welfare law training page. Um, for child in need of care and juvenile justice. Um, the Office of Judicial Administration is still working on revisions to the CASA and CRB standards. We anticipate recommended revisions will go to the court for consideration later this year. And twice per year, Office of Judicial Administration hosts training for child welfare stakeholders titled Best Practices in Child Welfare Law. The topics for 2022 will be April 19th and 20th, implicit bias, reasonable efforts, find, findings in child of need of care cases, and registration is now open. Um, there are links at the Kansas courts about the courts under programs, child welfare law training. August 23rd and 24th, the topic will be procedural fairness and termination of parental rights. He said they're also planning a six part webinar training series for judges who hear child in need of care cases. Those webinars will be scheduled in September and October of 22. Um, I, I will add that one of the CBCAT, the community-based child abuse prevention projects that we funded in the fall was um, a partnership with Washburn Law School to create a series of videos to help um, provide CLE training in, in the realm of family law. So I will make sure that Justice Wall has the links to those videos now that they're available because perhaps those will be helpful. Um, in their training work as well. It, uh, the status on that is that um, they're posted, they're available, and they are going through the review process to become the formal qualified CLE training um, opportunities for attorneys and future attorneys. So I think with that, unless there are questions, we are done with agency updates. Okay. Any final questions for any of the agency? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, is there anything you haven't updated us on? <laughs> um, to that if there is. In terms of the portfolio of work, I think we're good. I just put um, a few housekeeping items. Um, 
we, I, again, uh, I was going to mention that Kelly stepped into the role of uh, acting Bureau of Family Health Director, make, make her feel welcome. Um, we will, this year we will have additional work happening on the um, Early Childhood Integrated Data Project. So stay tuned for news and updates on that. At, at, I, we talked about the testimony that, that the cabinet has been asked to provide. Um, I expect more of those meetings as the session progresses. Um, we will continue to, I, I don't know in terms of our meetings, if we continue to meet virtually or if we pivot to um, in-person meetings again, some of it is dependent on the meeting space and their requirements and, and the will of the cabinet. So why don't we gauge where we are at our April meeting and have some cabinet discussion about the future of cabinet meetings. Um, and finally, we have a new member of the children's cabinet staff. We um, have hired Megan Broha to help us coordinate as a system specialist. I appreciate Megan um, already jumping in and helping with our PDG subgrants. Um, she's supporting the work of the recommendations panel um, for, through um, help for Debbie Deer. She's supporting the workforce development work that Hannah McGahey um, is engaged in. So she's an integral part of our PDG support team. So welcome, Megan. And um, I think in terms of updates, I'll leave it there and just um, offer that if any of you have questions along the way, you can always reach out. Um, if there's anything else on your minds today, now would be a great time to share. Yeah, we do have time if there's anything. I think the scope of this, I'll just share it. The scope of this work is hard for me to keep track of. Uh, it, and there's lots of acronyms. Uh, I don't know. Am I the only one? I hope, I hope it doesn't reflect my laziness of not pursuing this, but it seems like to me there's a lot to keep track of. Uh, and um, that's good. That's good, uh, especially when we hear reports like from Debbie that it's all being, uh, there's intentionality about coordinating it and people being aware of what each other's doing. So uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of everybody for what they're doing. But. Yeah, good alignment happening and, and collaboration. So I appreciate I see a that. lot of smiles. I don't know if that means people can identify with what I said or they're thinking, what a goof. I don't know. But uh, Look, John, are, is that a new hand in the air? It's a new hand. Um, uh, and I was smiling because I can relate. Kim, having spent years already in this field, I'm still learning things. Um, we know that learning the acronyms doesn't happen PDQ, but um, uh, still, I, I, you know, I, the one thing that I wanted to say, let me lower my hand because I wouldn't be keeping a hand up when I'm in person. Um, I wanted to, you know, in, in December, uh, I, th I think we approved a recommendation from the cabinet about encouraging the governor and the legislature to support uh, issues that help families meet their basic needs and just wanted to if I can provide a highlight of what we've been observing in the legislature, if that's appropriate. Yes. Great. So uh, the first up is House Bill 2525. Um, uh, House Bill 2525, which um, uh, reduces some of the barriers to accessing um, child care assistance and food assistance. Uh, most notably, it uh, removes the requirement for child support cooperation in order to be eligible for SNAP and child care assistance and also removes uh, some of the work requirements for people pursuing education so that they can complete uh, their education and um, make, have more earnings for their family. That bill passed out of House Children and Seniors unanimously this past Tuesday and now has an opportunity to be heard by the full House. Uh, so, I would, so I have plans to meet with the majority leader next week to talk about it, but I would say if anybody on this call or uh, uh, anybody on the cabinet or anybody listening has strong relationships with uh, Representative Dan Hawkins. Uh, this could be a good opportunity to um, maybe connect with me and I'll, I'll give you the, the details about what you could talk to him about. Um, what was that number? Sorry to interrupt. What was the House Bill number? House Bill 2525. Thank you. Yeah. And then I, I, this is where I get a little um, 
um, uh, shaky on my knowledge of uh, bill numbers, but there was also a, a bill here hearing on uh, a bill in uh, House Corrections and Juvenile Justice that removed the SNAP felony ban for people trying to uh, access the food assistance program. Um, that hearing went well, and, and I think we have a sense that maybe that bill can get out of co committee as well. One more step for uh, families being able to meet their basic needs by accessing the food assistance program. And then right now, um, I think probably by the end of today, there, there will be at least five bills in the legislature that will reduce the state sales tax on food. Some do it uh, kind of immediately. Some would do it over a gradual uh, time period. But four of those bills have had hearings in the, in the House and in the Senate. And so there is bipartisan interest in this. Um, and, and we know that if, if families aren't paying the state sales tax on food, that can save the average family about $500 a year. So that is more money that could be put towards basic needs. So there is some real there is some real progress, I think, happening in the legislature this session. And um, uh, we continue to remind folks that these issues can be bipartisan and should be bipartisan. John, I would remind that the food sales tax issue would also have a positive impact for child care providers and other Absolutely. programs um, that provide meals for kids that that. Um, pay sales tax currently. So it's it would be a win for kids in, in all kinds of ways. So, um, and then, yeah, it, do you want to mention the, the um, House Bill 2414, whether there's been any progress on the business child care tax I, credit? I'm trying to remember. So that one, that one is still just a, um, below the line and is available for a vote whenever the house is on the floor. I need to check in with uh, Mitch Arley, learning mm -hmm. policy advisor. But um, the good news is we uh, is um, uh, the, our conversations with the chair of house tax have always been favorable about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the one thing that uh, I, uh, I think we, I think we have both a Senate and a house version uh, available to be worked on the floor. So that's a good reminder. We, we, I need to check in on the status of that. Just uh, John or Melissa. So when, when's the turnaround date coming up? Or I, I, just a close approximation. I just... Turnaround is February 24th, I believe. And for those who uh, uh, don't know what turnaround means, uh, it's a great line from a, a, an 80s song, but it's also um, from Total Eclipse of the Heart. Uh, by Bonnie Tyler, but it's it's also the date in which the bills have to be kicked out of their chamber of order uh, of origin to the other chamber. So you, if it's a House bill, it needs to be passed out of the House, uh, and then it'll go to the Senate. Yeah, that may not apply to tax bills. I don't know, but uh, yeah, there's all sorts of workarounds to those rules. But know. technically, turnaround is that date where House and Senate need to complete their business. Um, um, their own legislation, and then the second half of the session is the opposite chambers. Bills cross over and get worked. So yeah, theoretically, and, uh, I believe Tuesday is the is the date, the last day for non-exempt committees to have bills drafted. So we'll start to see fewer concepts introduced in the legislature, uh, and so the calendar will maybe slow down a little bit. But they're still, um, as as you noted, Kim, federal and state affairs tax committees and um, appropriations. appropriations committees can always have bills drafted. Well, that's helpful to kind of, and, and frankly, uh, that's the most positive report I've heard about the Kansas legislature in my, in my recent memory. So uh, that's great. Uh, anything else for the good of the order, as they say? Just um, a, a quick reminder of our meeting schedule for cabinet members. Um, April, as Amy mentioned, will be the um, slate of grant award proposals, and the hopefully we'll have recommendations from the recommendations panel. So uh, a couple big issues for consideration. And then June is the meeting where we will take up budget recommendations for, believe it or not, FY state fiscal year 24. So um, lots of futures focused thinking needs to happen between now and then. Um, all of our meetings are obviously important. Um, August, we, we get some accountability updates, October as well. So um, there you have it, the first Friday of every other month starting at nine 
Um, and here we are wrapping up before 11. So yes. happy to give you a little bit of time back. Well, let's not, let's not uh, abuse that good situation. So unless is there anything else from any cabinet member that we have time. Can I, can I add one more brief, brief comment? Sure, sure. Melissa, Melissa, during the legislative session, if you need testimony, don't hesitate to reach out. You've got Thank a you. broad range of experience right here and we're all pretty articulate. We'd be glad to help. So never hesitate to let us know, okay? I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Well, I want to thank the cabinet members for sticking with this. Today has been a day of reports primarily and uh, appreciate your uh, patience with that. Uh, I think it's been good. I mean, I've been exciting to hear about these developments and uh, educate ourselves. So um, until we meet again, we are adjourned. Thank you.